let's start. I mean, it's, there's not a lot of uh, stuff in, in the slides. I'm not one of those people. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> hello, everybody. I don't know how many people of you are there, but... Uh, 22. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Uh, but uh, today, um, this, this, this talk is about um, Bayesian inference and um, estimating parameters of your model um, using Bayesian inference. And then I, I, um, I will try to do some motivating uh, examples of like, you know, why we would want to do this. Um, it's, um, <clears throat> it's not immediately obvious, like why is sort of Bayesian inference better than, you know, your standard sort of t-tests or, or any number of statistical tests and so on. Um, and I'm not Just, those... <laughs> sorry for interrupting, but why all the Bayesian talks are about why Bayesian is better than <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like uh you know you know when your eyes have been closed the whole uh all of your life and they open i uh, no, i'm not i'm not <laughs> proselytizing any anything and and um a lot of like the last point here for example um i'm i'm exaggerating like you know if you can use you know running a, you're running an a b test just just use a simple t test you're not you don't have to use bayesian inference um, but i I'll, I'll try to cover some of this like why we would we want to uh for example uh, use uh, this technique instead of just a simple uh, hypothesis test with like p-values, for example, right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'm shutting up and I'm not interrupting you. Sorry yeah, for interrupting that's you. All that's all good. As I said, I, I had designed the whole thing to be um, uh, interactive. Um, and I've kind of recycled some of this talk from an older talk. So for people who are listening, um, it was two hours in the beginning. So I've like cut down, cut it down a lot, but I'll try to, I'll have to move a bit quick. Um, hopefully we'll still cover the whole thing. So the outline is like, <clears throat> um, we, we like, you know, I'm not sure how many um, of you here are familiar with like, you know, what is Bayesian inference anyway? Like, you know, I'm sure like all of us read about Bayes theorem when we were in, in like high school um, and then sort of like forgot promptly about it um but 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 we'll, we'll go over it um and and we won't like do this like um you know we go through a bunch of theory and we do some examples and we'll, we'll just do a motivated example of a very very simple problem um which is a simple coin toss for example like a very simple thing and i'll ask some probing questions um that hopefully will will, will let you think about you know why we're doing things this way um and then in my original talk, I had a couple of like different um, demos. Um, the simplest one was actually solving the coin toss problem using um, PyMC3, which is the framework we'll be using to actually derive the distribution of parameters. Um, I solved the German tank problem, which is uh, an interesting thing. Uh, there's some linear regression stuff. Um, there is like some motivated reasoning about why Bayesian estimates might be better than classical hypothesis tests. I don't think we'll have the time to cover all of it, but I'll 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 go and sort of like see you know how much we can cover and like what's more important. Anyway, um, who am I? Uh, one minute introduction, maybe even less. Uh, hi all, my name is Prasoon. Um, I'm a data scientist. I'm based in Berlin. Um, I primarily work on several <clears throat> fintech roles. Uh, my first job actually was funny enough in, in classical um, investment banking risk management thing. Um, and I got tired of that very quickly. And then I was trying to figure out which industry will hire me. And it turns out that a, lo a lot of data science roles are like very similar um, uh, kind of overlap. So, um, and then uh, th that was in India. Then I moved to Ber Berlin. Um, I've had a job here at uh, a company called N26, which is a neobank, a company called Klarna, which is a um, buy now, pay later solution. Um, and lastly, at Stripe, which is a payments company. Uh, and my role has sort of differed um, widely across these companies. In some cases, it's like been completely about model development. In some cases, it's been more about experimentation, you know, convincing stakeholders what is the right thing to do, things like that. Um, that's briefly about me. Um, you can follow me on LinkedIn, I suppose. I don't have any other social channels. Um, anyway, so simple, simple um, thought experiment. Um, I tell you, uh, you as in the audience, uh, I have a coin and I ask you the question, is the coin fair, right? Um, like, you know, um, imagine I'm holding the coin in my hand. You can't even see it. Is the coin fair, right? So what does fair mean even? So, you know, we can reform the question, you know, what is fair? Fair is like if we can compute probability um, of, of getting a heads on the coin and then 
if it's within you know some tolerance it's if it's very close to the probability of getting tails on the coin um we would say that the coin is fair right <clears throat> now um again i do not know the um composition of the audience look so uh some of you who've done more statistics like you would uh, you know this is a classic estimation problem uh this is a classic point estimation problem um and so Anyway, this is the point where I would have asked questions to the audience, but I'll, I'll just ask this to you, Alexei. Like, so uh, given I have this this thing, um, what is the easiest thing you would do to, to de determine like the probability of heads on this coin? Like uh, flip it uh, ten times or hundred times, and then uh, record all the uh, observe what happens, and then at the end determine. Like if it's 50 50 like if i get 50 heads 50 tails mm -hmm. then yeah it's it's fair yeah yeah otherwise like depending on how much exactly more heads or tails then yeah and, and that's exactly it um <clears throat> so for example yeah like we flip the coin many number of times and you know we compute this thing p of h probability of heads is the you know number of heads divided by the number of coin tosses and this is called estimation so for those of you not from a you know you know this is classic point estimation and in fact if you're familiar with sort of any sort of estimates um this you know this is a very classic binomial distribution problem so a binomial distribution problem uh is is an outcome a binomial outcome is when you have some probability of getting a success and then you run that uh, sort of experiment many times and you get some successes and you get some failures and then essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the maximum likelihood estimator um, for the binomial likelihood. Now, again, I don't know the composition of the audience. If this, this sounds like gibberish to you, forget about it. Like we're not you know, going into the maths of this stuff. We will go into a little bit of maths, but that's basically it. Um, but like for those of you who do know, it's simple. Like if, if you take the binomial likelihood and you compute the MLE for that, you literally get the, the fraction that we just calculated. Um, anyway, so... Um, at this point, you know, let's say that we flip the coin many times, um, you know, we get, as Alexei said, like, you know, maybe if you flip it hundred times, we get like, um, you know, I don't know, 55 heads, 45 tails, you know, we're, we're like, oh, you know, this, this looks, this looks okay. Um, this looks according to sort of my previous experience of most coins, which is like, oh yeah, it's 50, 50, right? It's, it's close enough. But imagine we flip the coin only five times, right? That's five times. And the result that it's also like, you know, four heads and one tail, you know. A question to ask is like, would you think that the probability of heads is 80%? Um, Alexei, would, what would you say? I mean, I, I know that there's, there is a catch, right? <laughs> no, 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 I mean, yeah, like, I'm just I'm just like trying to do, you know, uh, simple reason, like a, a normal no, person, you know, would you? I would not, yeah. Right, yeah, and then like- Like it's not enough data. Not enough data, yeah, exactly, right? But like, but, is there my question to you is like are you injecting somehow your experience of like the coins you've seen in the past into this calculation somehow Definitely. right exactly right that's what I, i'm doing yes yeah exactly most and, of the and, coins i saw are all of them were fair i assume yeah, yeah. uh for some definition of fair like you know we don't can't like you know there's quantum uncertainty and shit. anyway <laughs> uh, but uh yeah like uh when we get four out of five heads um I mean, imagine this was not a coin though. Imagine it was like, <clears throat> you know, some system that produces, you know, a probability of, of like, you know, heads and tails, and you had no information about whether it would be 50-50 normally, right? I think most of us would say that there is less of an error in this world. Like intuitively, we would say, oh, it's more likely that yes, maybe the, the, the probability of success is actually closer to 80%. Whereas if it's a coin, we are like very unlikely to say, hey, it's, it's actually probably not close to 80%. It's probably 50% and it's just like too little data. Mm -hmm. And this is like two different classes of, um, of uncertainties coming in into this result, right? So at this point, um, I'll try to, <clears throat> I'll try to do something like, I'll, let me see, if, I'm sure you should be able to see my screen. Uh, still, so this is like a little. You can zoom in. Um, yeah, yeah, I will. I don't know five times. Um, is this? That's is this... that's visible. Yes. Okay, cool. So this is just a collab notebook. Um, <clears throat> this is a new laptop. I don't have my setup in here, <laughs> but uh, this is the collab notebook. It's also like easy to for anybody to run online. 
Um, and essentially, this is this is exactly our experiment that we were talking about, but we've just done it in 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 code. So what we're doing is um, maybe a little bit smaller. Uh, what we're doing is, you know, we say, you know, this is the same thing we were doing: number of heads divided by number of coin tosses. So let's first choose like a random probability. Um, so we're choosing this p of heads. Um, I'm not going to print out this value yet. Uh, we're just randomly choosing a probability uh, of success. Now, if you know anything about the beta function, this will tell you that the probability is probably going to be less than 0.5. But anyway, uh, that's not necessary. We have some probability that we don't, don't know. We're doing 100 coin tosses, um, and we're going to make a guess uh, based on the 100 coin tosses of what is, uh, oh, this is actually very close. Um, but depending on like the number of times you do this experiment, um, so the green is like, you know, close to 0 0.8. That's the um, uh, true probability. And the guessed one is like, you know, slightly about that, right? Um, and then we can do the experiment again. And this time we see much bigger errors, right? Uh, anyway, my point was, uh, let me just quickly go through it. Um, we could also do, for example, the same experiment 500 times. Um, and so, for example, you get this kind of a table out of it. So, you know, you have the tosses on the top, you know, 100 tosses, and you have the number of trials you've done on the on the left, on the columns. And, you know, you can see TH, TH, TH. And then you can do the same thing as before. Like, we can try to guess um, the number of uh, heads we're getting uh, to estimate this. Like, why we, why are we doing this? Like, when Alexei said, like, let's let's toss the coin 10 times, right? We'll get, like, some, you know, let's say five, five heads and tails. If we toss the coin 10 times again, I think most of us intuitively understand that we might not get the same outcome. In fact, the fewer the number of coin tosses, the, the more likely that, you know, just, just by chance, we get like very different outcomes. So this is what exactly that is showing us here. We did, um, what is it? Uh, 500 trials and we each, each of them, we did 100 uh, coin tosses, right? And then essentially, um, we just plot the distribution of the 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 value of probability of heads that we got right and you can see the distribution and before uh, i won't like bore you with too many details you know if we do you know a lot many coin tosses per experiment so instead of uh, 100 we toss 10000 times we get a very very like um narrow distribution uh, so it means we have like low variance and similarly if we do the same number actually of, of coin flips, but like we flip the script, so instead of doing 500 tries and 10,000 tosses, we're doing 50,000 tries and 100 tosses. This time, the distribution is wider, but it's like more smooth that you can see, right? Anyway, my point is, uh, the point I was trying to make with this is, <clears throat> um, it's intuitively obvious to us that, you know, the, the more times we do the experiment, whatever type of experiment we design, we'll get a different value of P of heads, right? And that sort of starts to hint at, you know, we can't necessarily discover the true value of P of heads, right? We would have to perform in classical statistics, like infinite number of coin tosses to discover the true value of P of heads, right? And what this sort of like distribution was, I was trying to show is that given enough tosses, you can sort of get a, you know, a distribution over the thing that we're trying to estimate, right? Now, of course, in classical statistics, you would say that, you know, um, the, the, the true value of parameter, which is the probability of heads, is, is a fixed thing. It's fixed. It's set. It's just like we don't know it. We can try to estimate it, but it's fixed, right? However, um, what I want to go back to is like in this case, you know, when we have, you know, four out of five heads, we intuitively think that actually, you know what, this is weird. It's, it's probably wrong because, you know, all the coins I've seen in my life, have been 50-50 generally, right? What we're trying, what we're doing here, as I mentioned earlier, is we're injecting our earlier experience of all the coins we've seen in the world into this decision making. It's like, hey, it's, it's, um, it shouldn't be this high, right? Um, anyway, so <clears throat> now I'll, I'll take like a second to just go over probability and belief, and like you know the the difference of like the classical statistical, which is called frequentist model and the Bayesian model. So the classical statistical model of like, you know, coin tosses, for example, is like, you know, we just do the thing many times, right? Then ideally an infinite number of times and we, we get, you know, this, this fraction probability of heads and we uh, 
the more times we do it, the, the, the closer the distribution converges until it converges to one value, like it did here, for example. You know, it, uh, we did we were doing 10,000 tosses and, you know, distribution became like very, very narrow. Um, so as you go to infinity, this distribution converges to the true value of the parameter. But this is classical statistics. And I mean, I mean, this this kind of makes sense easily, you know, and 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 um, in the in the way that classical statistics or frequent statistics was designed, uh, it was initially designed for 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 gamblers and 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 so on uh, in the 1800s. So it kind of makes sense, you know. You throw a uh, you throw a coin, you know. You throw some dice, you know. You can do it multiple times. But there are some other probabilities that don't make, you know, intuitive sense in that sort of manner. So let's think about it. What is the probability of, you know, that we'll get snow tomorrow? Um, I think if it, if I were to ask like a normal person, um, and if I if I told them, hey, let's simulate, you know. Uh, a million universes in which there might or might not be snow that they'd think I've gone crazy. But if you were, were to ask a normal person on the street, like, what do you think is the chance of snow tomorrow? They understand that sentence, right? It's winter, you know, if you ask, ask in the summer, people would say, no, there's no chance of snow. And then it's winter, it's like, yeah, it's more chance of snow. Um, well, what I'm trying to get at is that there are these events, you know, they don't, you can't replicate them. Um, the, the tomorrow of, of, of Berlin in Germany will only come once, you know, you can't, have like a hundred variations of that spun up, right? Um, and still somehow the statement of, you know, what is the probability that we'll get snow tomorrow does make sense. What is the chances that like some X candidate will win an election? It makes intuitive sense to people, right? And that's where sort of this Bayesian view of probability comes in. It's 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 less about, you know, parameter estimation and like, you know, you know, you're doing, you know, a one million flips of a coin and measuring how many heads you got. No, it's more about the the sort of belief that you have in an event occurring that event might be something that can be repeated like a coin flip that event might be something that couldn't be repeated like for example like the sun will rise tomorrow if you were to ask somebody the probability you know they'll first think you've gone mad again uh, but like yes the sun will rise tomorrow because of our experience right um and and so that's that's like the subjective sort of difference between these two things um what is more objective is like uh, sorry what is more useful you know this this is all definitions what is more useful is like how can we use this right and the way we use this is like uh the best thing about um sort of bayesian way of doing calculations of probabilities is, is is the is the update or the modulation so that's that's jargon um so what does it actually mean right um imagine <clears throat> if i were you know so the other day something weird happened on my Alexa. I often ask it to like flip a flip a coin, and I asked it to flip a coin five times in a row, and it said kept saying heads every single time, and I was like, "This is weird. Is this a bug?" All right? Um, and so so I just kept asking it, and the the more times I asked, and the more times it kept saying heads, the more I sort of started to believe that actually this might be a bug. This is weird. You know, I shouldn't I get to hits try well. that at home too. Yeah. How do no, you do this, Alexa? Flip a coin. Wait. Hey, hey, Alexa, flip a coin. Was it tails? Heads. Uh, Heads. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I, I do this often, like you know, when I'm like, ah, should I go or should I not? It's called Alexa flip a coin, and then I. Just... Anyway, um, my point is like. The more times I saw these heads show up, I was it's like it, it changed my belief in in what I would have thought. Like normally, if I ask Alexa to flip a coin, it's just simple, you know, it's 50-50 heads tails. But you know, the more I saw it, I'm like, there there must be a bug, right? And I, I don't know if they fixed it yet, or is it just or is it just for me? But that's that's essentially the 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 gist of of Bayesian probability. And I, I won't go into like the mathematical details, but it's, the best part about Bayesian probability is it it allows you to online. Uh, you know, it, it it allows you to update your belief about something as more data comes in. So, like in 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 technical jargon, we would say this is like an online method, which means like as more and more data comes in, at every single point, you don't have to like rerun the entire set of analysis again. You just have to do a step update. But anyway, um, I won't go too too much into detail. I'm see, I'm looking at the time. I probably have another twenty minutes, fifteen minutes. Uh, so I'll try to rush some things through. Um, okay, can you show full screen? That oh yes, be more right. visible. Um, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I don't know. Let me see if I need too much full screen. Okay, let's just do full screen. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah. So practical questions: 
how do we use this? You know, how do we, you know, all of my earlier points about like, it's better than using a, a t-test or, or so, right? So uh, I'll just quickly go, go over it. So in Bayesian sort of interpretation of probability, probability is a measure of belief, you know, and, and, and it's subjective, like different observers can, have, for the same event, can assign different probabilities to the probability of the event because it depends on their personal experience, which is which is like what I feel like that's more intuitive and that's what more people, normal people, um, tend to think of uh, when you think when you think about probability. Um, I won't go too much. It's just a standard probability notation based theorem. I'm sure all of us have um, read this in in our uh, high schools and stuff. But okay, actually, let's just go over it really quickly. Um, the D is the data we collect from an event. So in this case, when you flip a coin, D is just number of heads and number of tails. Um, our hypothesis is something about like, um, you know, uh, yes, yeah, so we have like some um, existing belief of, of what that event should be. In this case, we have some existing belief about like, if you flip a coin, it should like land 50% heads, 50% tails, right? And then D is the data. And the base theorem says essentially is like if you multiply this thing, which is the probability of the data happening, given our hypothesis is true, times the actual um, probability distribution of our hypothesis, um, then we get the the the, the you know the, the posterior. Um, it's like too much technical jargon. Let me um, quickly just skip all of this. Um, da, 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 da. Essentially, the idea is we start with some belief about the coin tosses. In this case, we think it's most likely to be 50%. And then, you know, our probability that the coin isn't 50% sort of falls off. That's our experience. And then we do the coin flips. We get the data. And then we get that, you know, four out of five heads, 80%. And then we modulate that probability a little bit with our experience. So what we would say is like, oh, if we get four out of five heads, and the probability of heads is probably not 80%, but it's probably higher than 50%. You know, that's how we would modulate the data. And that's that's all this multiplication stuff is. You know. Anyway, um, I don't want to, hmm, maybe I should go into this, but okay. So I'll, I'll cover this very quickly. It's just, uh, it's just the classical way of estimating things. So this is, uh, for those of you who know, this is just the binomial formula. This is the probability of um, getting, you know, small n number of heads in capital N number of trials. Um, and then let's talk about the beta prior for a sec. You know, again, I'm, I'm jumping into jargon, but let's talk about, about, about the beta distribution. This is the beta distribution here. And what I'm showing here on the animation is, you know, beta distribution has two parameters, alpha and beta. As alpha and beta change, the distribution sort of changes like this. And why I'm showing this is, um, think about the coin toss example. How would you think about the, you know, without seeing any data, how would you think about the probability of getting a heads? Well, you would think maybe it's like something like this, you know, uh, so the coil thing has moved off, but you would think it's something like, you know, something that peaks around like 0 0.5 and then sort of falls back down. So something like this, right? Um, this is the distribution we will take that, that our experience tells us that, hey, most likely the coins, you know, probability of Hess distribution looks like this. It's peaked around 0 0.5 and then it falls off very quickly. So this is the, the, the sort of formula for that. Um, and this is, um, I won't explain this. Uh, so you can see it in the slides afterwards, but it is very simple. We take the base sort of um, formula I showed you earlier. We multiply the, Likelihood, this is the uh, binomial likelihood with the uh, beta distribution that I just showed you. So this thing, we multiply that with the binomial likelihood and it's it's very simple multiplication. Um, and essentially at the end of the day, you get this formula for the posterior distribution. So what we're trying to do here is we have um, some, let me go back to the, da, 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 da. we have some hypothesis, this pH, this is the probability distribution that we're modeling using the beta function. So it goes up, peaks around 0 0.5, and goes back down. And it's symmetric around 0 0.5. Then we have some data. Given that, if uh, you know our probability of heads was some value, what is the chance that we'll see the data that we see? This is this thing. And if you multiply them together, we get the posterior. That is to say, the distribution 
of this parameter that sort of incorporates our experience. So four out of five heads, but we have injected our experience into it. And that's this distribution on the left. It's called the posterior. Um, and the names prior and posterior uh, kind of make sense. Prior is what you think before you do the experiment and sort of posterior is what you think after you've sort of incorporated the data that you see into the experiment. Anyway, um, so the reason I've done this is because we'll compare the posterior calculation using this way and using the uh, simulation way, which is PyMC, which is a software or framework that we use to calculate uh, posterior probabilities. Um, and I'll go into a second um, about like, why do we even need that? Like here, we've just calculated the formula right away. Why do we even need PyMC, you know? Um, anyway, so this is how PyMC works. Um, and, and actually, <clears throat> uh, let me see the time, so, uh, 5.30, okay. I'll, <clears throat> I'll try to explain how to model a problem using Bayesian inference. So forget about PyMC, forget about Bayesian inference. The first thing to do is like you need to produce the generative process of how the data comes to be, right? In this case, um, what we would do is imagine we have a random number generator uh, between zero and one. We pluck out a random number from there. Um, let's say we get 0 0.65. Then we will create a loaded coin, which has you know probability of heads as 0 0.65. And then we'll flip this coin um, 100 times, let's say. And then based on this data and based on our original expectation of probability, which is like, yeah, it's probably 0 0.5, you know, we multiply these probabilities together and then we get the posterior, right? Now, in this case, I'm already saying, I'm already telling you that the you know probability of heads is 0 0.65. But in, in truth, it's not known. What I'm trying to tell is that you need to think about the process using which the data will be generated, right? Now, this is a very simple problem. Like there, there's other problems which are, uh, you know, when you try to model them, you have like 20 parameters and, you know, you have to make a distributed exactly graph of like, you know, this happens and then this happens and you have all of these variables. Um, but for this talk, let's keep it very simple. Um, let's just follow the simple process, you know, like we pluck a random number between zero and one um, from our prior, you know, uh, the way we think the, the probability should be. Using that prior, we design a loaded coin, we flip the coin, we see the data, and then we modulate the probability that we get uh, the posterior using our sort of prior. Um, anyway, now, how do we do this um, uh, in, in code? Um, so actually, let me just sort of skip this and just go to the code because we are short on time. Um, <clears throat> so, what we've done is like, you know, these are imports that are like common across most sort of uh, data science tasks. But the important one is here. This is PyMC3, which we will use to model our um, our process, the data generating process. Um, and so this is the formula that we calculated in the slide. Um, I won't go into the details, but this B at the bottom, it's for the beta function. And then these are the theta is the probability of heads. This thing over here, it's the probability of heads. This we calculated in the slides. Again, I won't go into the details of how it is, but imagine, imagine we flip a coin 50 times and we get 32 heads, right? Um, and then we take a beta prior. So if I go back to my beta prior, what is it? This one, right? And you can see as we change alpha and beta, the shape of this function changes. This is our prior. This is our um, worldly experience of what the probabilities could be, right? So what we do here, we go here, and the very first thing is we plot our prior space. So this is without doing any experiments on the data. Uh, let me let's make it a bit smaller. Without doing any experiments on the data, we are saying this is the distribution of the probability of heads on the coin. Um, this is the sort of our worldly experience that we start with. Now, how did I pick that? You know, there's, there's a whole sort of like literature about how do, how do you pick your priors in, in sort of Bayesian analysis. But I think this makes intuitive sense. Like it peaks around 0 0.5. You know, we don't know whether heads or tails is more likely. So it's symmetrical. And then, you know, we pick some sort of a distribution that sort of goes to zero around like zero and one, right? Because the, there can be no coin that will only, always only show heads, right? Unless it's both sides heads, but anyway. Um, so this kind of, it makes intuitive sense as a prior, right? 
And then what do we do is first we will, and you know, you can look at the code later on, but essentially what I'm trying to do here is we take this formula that we calculated here. This is analytically, we're not using pi mc3, we just compute the formula of the posterior uh, by hand, and then we plot it here. So, so this blue line is our updated um, posterior of probability of heads, and the red line is the true probability of heads. So in this case, what is the red line? The red line is 32 divided by 50, because we got 32 heads out of 50 trials, right? The blue line is a modulation of this probability. So in the beginning, you can see it goes all the way from zero, zero to one, you know, it's symmetrical, it's centered at 0 0.5. But once we plug everything into this formula, we get this sort of narrower and shifted distribution, right? You can see that, you know, there is no chance that probability of heads is like less than 0 0.4 or it's more than 0 0.8. Um, and then it's peaked almost at the same point of, you know, where the, where the true um, uh, probability lies, right? So this is, we've done this manually, right? However, um, in pretty much any problem that's beyond the sort of toy problem of, of like computing uh, probability of heads, you won't be able to model the, um, the posterior distribution analytically. That is to say, you can't just plug in a bunch of formulas and get a formula at the other end. It's, it's the same as like trying to solve a big differential equation. You sometimes don't have closed solutions to plot. So what instead um, you can do is you can use pi mc, which is, you know, without going into too many of the details, it, it essentially simulates um, the process that you've defined. So you've defined this data generating process. It simulates that again and again and again, but it does so in an intelligent way. So imagine we're, we're only trying to estimate one parameter. We don't actually have to use pi mc3 or, or you know, one, these these fancy algorithms we can just you know do it in 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 a you know python for loop and it'd be fine but as you grow in the number of parameters the more and more parameters you have your uh, you know the the usual um uh, what's it called the sin of dimensionality or or something like that um that because of that you have like curse the curse of exactly sorry. the curse of dimensionality uh, you have you, your your um parameter space like it just grows like crazy the more parameters you have and then uh, it becomes quickly like beyond two parameters it just becomes like quickly infeasible to just like run a simulation manually you need intelligent algorithms to run the simulation uh, these algorithms are uh, called mcmc markov chain monte carlo um the name sounds you know again like massive massively jargonful uh, but you know monte carlo simulations are as some of you might have heard like you know if you repeat an experiment many times that's just monte carlo simulation and markov chains it just means that when you repeat a when you do a new simulation you do the next one based on the results of the previous one so that you you take imagine in in deep learning you know when you you don't you don't explore the entirety of the loss space um, for getting your minimum no you intelligently like go down a hill it's the same thing here you intelligently figure out where to sample in the sampling space um, if this sounds like too much of like gibberish to you um, it's fine you know like we don't have enough time to cover most of it but essentially and I'll provide these notebooks afterwards um, this is our old experiment you know where we got four heads and one tails. Right. What we can do is we can just put four heads and one tails into the um, uh, <clears throat> into the uh, formula that we have here. Uh, we're still not using pi mc, and we get this kind of a distribution. So it is exactly as I was saying before. You know, if you get four heads and one tails, you think, oh, that's probably not right. Zero point eight is probably not the correct answer for the probability of s. But it's it may be more than zero point five because like it's it's kind of weird that you're getting four, right? And this distribution still shows the same thing. We went from this, right, which is like centered around zero point five, to this, which is centered around like zero point seven maybe, um, and it's more like shifted to the right. So that this is essentially the in a nutshell what you know Bayesian inference does. It takes your experience, injects it into the data that you found, right? Anyway, lastly. Now let's actually run a pi mc model. And as I said, the way to run a pi mc model is to think about how the data are generated, right? So in this case, uh, we'll do it two ways. One, we'll do it with a Bernoulli trial. And a Bernoulli trial is just a fancy word of an experiment that can result in a success or a failure, zero or one, simple, right? Uh, and then we'll do it with a binomial um, experiment results, right? We'll, we'll cover that in a minute. So. <clears throat> So in this case, right, uh, remember that small n is 32, 
capital N is 50. Um, so what we do is we just, just generate a string of values, which is like um, 32 ones, and then the remaining 18 or so zeros, right? This is a string of Bernoulli trials. The order doesn't matter because each sort of flip is independent of the other. So we could just we can just have all the ones on one side, all the zeros on the other side, right? This is the data that we've observed. You know, this is how you encode the observations, right? And then this is the interesting bit. This is how you make a model. So I'll just zoom in a bit. Oh, come on. I'll just zoom in a little bit so everybody can see. So you start um, <clears throat> by, I, I, I haven't done it in a while, so I don't have to remember. Yes, okay, there you go. You start off with creating a beta distribution like we did before. Uh, so you start off with, uh, with this distribution, right? You say, okay, from this distribution, I will pluck a probability P, right? And uh, this is the probability of heads that we're randomly sampling what is this, from uh, this beta distribution we showed earlier. And then we take that probability. With that, we perform a Bernoulli trial, which is some experiment that can be result, you know, result in success or failure, right? The result of that experiment is Y, right? So we do a Bernoulli trial, we pass in this probability. So it, it, you can think of it as a directed graph. So step one, we get a probability. Step two, we pass it to the Bernoulli trial and we get the result here, right? And then we tell the, uh, the framework that the actually observed data is from this sort of like end state is this string of ones and zeros, right? And then we plot what is called a trace. The reason it's called a trace is because of how the algorithms are made. So I won't go into the details, but basically if you think about this, this, this is the posterior distribution of the value of the probability that we're trying to calculate. So you can see here, it's actually very similar to um, the distribution we got um, manually, which is here. Um, <clears throat> and of course, like this looks wider, but because you can see it's actually cut down at 0 0.4 and 0 0.8, it's, it's not beyond that. And if you go back to the original calculation done uh, manually, you can see it's the same thing, 0 0.4, 0 0.8. Uh, that's the width of the, of the distribution, right? So this is very simply how you can sort of run um, a um, pi MC model and get, get a posterior out of it. There's a ton of stuff you can do with this. You can sort of figure out the, the peak of the model. You know, um, there, there's a bunch of functions here. You can figure out the 95% high density interval, um, which is similar to like, you know, the confidence interval, but actually it makes intuitive sense. Like, you know, uh, a gotcha question in a lot of like stats interviews is like, what is the confidence interval? And people say, you know, this is like uh, with 95% probability, my parameter is going to be between these two values. That's wrong, right? That's not the correct definition of, of confidence intervals. But then if you want to explain a confidence interval to like somebody who's in senior management, like, you know, you, you can't, you, it, it's hard for you to convey the exact statistical properties of that to somebody who's like, you know, the, like a C-level person or whatever. Whereas this is actually the belief, the probability in, in this parameter, right? So you can literally say this is the, you know, the, the HDI is the high density interval is the 95% probability interval for this for this parameter, you know, like um, P is definitely, you know, 95% belief going to be between like 0 0.5 and like, you know, 0 0.75 or something, right? Anyway, um, I see we're nearing 1745. I'll, I'll quickly go over the same thing, um, but with um, a um, binomial process, um, just to show you that we can model the same thing in different ways. So what is a binomial process? You know, a binomial process, is imagine you flip you know 50 coins and you get 32 heads and then there's like some probability of success sort of built inside of this machine right but instead of getting the string of ones and zeros instead you're getting two values you have two values you have the number of successes and the number of trials that's all you have right and if you think about our coin flip example it can be modeled as this as well right like instead of instead of individually counting ones and zeros we just ask somebody hey can you do like 50 tosses and they do it and they tell you just two numbers 32 and 50 right same thing here we start off with a with a model we say uh and this time i've done um we've i've, I've gone one step further so if you remember the beta prior that we had before we had fixed the value of a and b such that the distribution of the beta prior was fixed, right? Here we've gone one step ahead of that because you know we don't necessarily know 
you know, how the beta prior looks like, right? So what we've done is we've uniformly sampled the parameters of the beta prior, which is A and B, right? That go into the, so essentially, if instead of having one distribution like this on the prior, we have a collection of these curves. Uh, and from that collection, we actually get our, you know, probability of X. Um, and then it's very sim similar, you know, we feed A and B into this beta prior, um, and then we get out a value of probability P. Right? And then we feed that P into a binomial model and we tell it that, hey, we've observed um, you know, this data and we've actually done this number of flips. Um, and then can you show me uh, a trace? And so and now we get three traces here because we have three parameters. We have A, B, uh, which we don't really care about. And then we have uh, the, the trace of the... Um, the actual probability, the probability of it. And again, you will see it's very similar to before. I mean, the, the shape is slightly different, but you know, it cuts off at 0 0.4, maximum is 0 0.8, peaks around 0 0.65, um, which is exactly like, you know, uh, the value we calculated manually, right? This is our analytical calculation. It's very similar, right? So at this point, <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm trying to think what is the best way forward here. Um, I could do another example, but it's fine. I won't do it. Uh, I think it's at this point, it's more important to like, just talk about why this is useful. Um, and I had, I had a couple of things prepared and I'll, I'll try to share it later on. Um, but for example, uh, we have the German tank problem here, which is, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll quickly, you know, in a minute cover what it was. So in world war two, the allies, um, captured German tanks and the German tanks were numbered from like one, two, three, four. Uh, it was sequential numbering. And so, <clears throat> um, the, the allies wanted to estimate how many tanks Germans were making per month. And if you, if you think about that, you know, I, I had a whole section planned of like, you know, but we don't have the time. Uh, but if you think about that, um, if you know that the numbers are sequential, right. And the, the, the highest number of tank that you caught was like 913 there were at least 913 tanks, possibly more, right? And then you can go with like the um, classical statistical procedures to estimate the actual number of tanks. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a very involved process. You have to like really think about stuff. You have to know these like weird distributions and so on, which I think most of us don't really know. We, you know, we, we operate on the student's T distribution, you know, 95% of the time, that's, that's enough, right? So it's very hard to do that. However, with, with a Bayesian, approach like here, I mean, of course they couldn't have done it because they don't have, they didn't have the processing power, but we do. Um, so with a Bayesian approach, what you can think of is like a data generation process, which is like, oh, this is a factory. It is churning out tanks, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? And then you have a filter which randomly picks out tanks from this like list, right? And at a certain point it stops. And then what you what you end up with is like this, this, this list of numbers, you know, 25, 38 and so on, right? And then you model this as a, and, and all the distributions are, are very easy here. Like, you know, um, the first one is like just uniformly producing numbers. The second one is like uniformly picking numbers from this. So it's like easy distributions and you model this process exactly as I showed you here uh, with like, you know, three or four lines. Um, and then out the other end, you get the probability uh, of the of the, the maximum, um, or sorry, the, the number of tanks that were produced, for example, right? Um, so this, that's one reason why we would rather want to do like a Bayesian approach than a than a normal estimation approach because it's just easier. It's just it just makes a lot of things clearer because you first think about how the process is modeled. So how you think about how the data is being generated. A lot of the times, like I feel like in in sort of like our ML sort of applications, we you know. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, what we're doing in most ML models is parameter estimation. The thing is, we never really care about the distribution of those parameters. We just look at oh, this is the parameter, right? Um, and then if if the distribution of one of those parameters is really fucked up, like you know, it, it can, it, you know, depending on the data, it can really mess up your predictions in some cases, right? So anyway, uh, this is one reason. What is the other reason to use um, uh, sort of Bayesian methods? Uh, especially in like hypothesis testing um, and, and confidence interval estimation. So I'll, I'll cover the hypothesis testing bit first. Um, so <clears throat> if you, you know, once you've done enough, you know, when, when I first started doing hypothesis tests, 
You know, I, I just have to keep remembering what is supposed to be the null hypothesis and you're like, is it the opposite? You know, I, I can never like really remember. And then, you know, I, I kept forgetting like, is, is PVL supposed to be less than 0 0.5 or more? I, you know, like it just, and then you do it a few few times and then sort of sticks in your head. Um, but if you ever think about, you know, sit down to think about uh, hypothesis tests, it's almost always predicated on like, I don't know, 20 different assumptions. You know, you think about, you know, oh, I'll just run a t-test. But then you think about the data generating processes. You think about how many samples you have, um, and like all these, you know, things like heteroscedasticity, and like I don't even remember like all of these assumptions. And I think like most of us never actually test out these assumptions. We're just like, yeah, we'll just run a t test, um, or we'll just run an f test or whatever, right? Test of proportions, and we never really think about the the assumptions or if they're being correctly held or not. Uh, I had this like really interesting thread uh, in Stripe, uh, you know, my, some of my colleagues um, were thinking about this and, and running tests. And so what they did, they did some simulations about, um, you know, we just assume that, uh, you know, the, the, the sample mean is, is normally distributed. Let's actually plot and see in from an experiment if the sample mean is actually normally distributed. It was, it was this like weird flat distribution. Uh, in truth, right? And we we're trying to put like confidence intervals on, on that using the assumption that it's going to be normally distributed. Um, and it wasn't, right? So the nice thing with, with sort of Bayesian methods is that you don't have to worry about assumptions. As long as you're modeling your data generating process correctly, you, I mean, there are other pitfalls with, with Bayesian methods, but uh, we don't have the time to cover that. But essentially, the easy thing is you never you never really have to worry about you know that you're not satisfying the assumptions right because you're you're literally modeling the process end to end the second nice thing is uh, in any kind of complex process um you have multiple steps like like in the tank you know german tank problem you have like the first step which generates the tanks the second step which you know somebody bombs the tanks randomly right at each point you can see the distribution of 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 values of of any values that you can see during that point in the process and sort of like just just do a sanity check. Hey, like, oh, if I look at the tanks which are being bombed, it's just there's they're, they're in a sequence. That's weird. So something in your data generating process is wrong. So it helps you debug your data generating processes. And the final thing, I think that's the best reason. Like even you know even if you could run a t test, simple t test, why should you use like you know the three four lines of of, of code instead? Is because you get a uh, you get a, a, a posterior which is a distribution and a distribution is like significantly more helpful in making decisions than a binary um, yes no answer that you would get in a hypothesis test. Oh, my p value is zero point um, zero four nine. You know, It'll, ah, you know, okay, I'll, I'll, or or it's just above the zero point five threshold, right? Uh, and then, and and you know, in 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 most cases, uh, especially in in academia, you'd be like, yes, you know, you uh, all this p hacking stuff comes in, and and you know, you you have to make a binary decision. Whereas in most real world scenarios, like especially like you know, in our like, suppose you run an experiment, um, and your p value is slightly above zero point five, does that mean we don't have to like roll out the change? No, you look at the you look at the shape of the distribution, and then you decide. Uh, oh, maybe there's like a, this long tail and like we're stuck in the long tail or like, you know, I don't have an example right now, but essentially what would you rather prefer to have a yes, no answer or a sort of a distribution and you can sort of make the reasons afterwards. You can figure out what is the better way. Um, and that's why, um, you know, I, I always recommend doing t-tests. Um, again, we don't have the time at the moment, but like, I and I will try to put some of these resources in. Um, so for example, by MC3 uh, GLM. There is a GLM module, which essentially lets you skip most of these steps. Um, and if there's any kind of like a linear process, you can model it very, is it the correct page or not? Anyway, I'll, I'll link this page in the, in the, in the notes, but um, you don't even have to like worry about having a long um, set of modeling assumptions here. Is this? Like here, for example, this is very simple. But if you think about like larger processes, this can be like you know twenty lines of code in here. Um, if you if you just want to use you know I don't want to use the t test. There is this GLM module in PyMC which you can use directly. Um, I will also link a talk in the show uh, in the in the notes, uh, which is um, why the um, Bayesian inference is superior. It's a very nice. Uh, 
essay, uh, and this essay is by um, by uh, John Krushker, which is uh, if any of you has read a you know Bayesian book, there's a book with like four dogs on top of it. Uh, this is the guy who wrote that book, and he has this like really nice essay, and there's also a YouTube talk um, which sort of like proves this point. But um, yeah, I will close here. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't cover more, but we, we are limited by time. Uh, and I'll try to give some time for questions if there are any. Yeah. yeah, you've covered quite a lot already. So that was a lot of information. I'm just wondering. So one example that you gave was hypothesis testing. Would you say this is the primary use case for Bayesian statistics in industry these days, or there are other cases? Um, <clears throat> So one example I wanted to give, so I would say most people don't even use this, you know, like, you know, when your question is like in the industry, nobody uses it, unfortunately, right? I mean, the, nobody. I mean, that's probably, you know, exactly maybe 2%, what, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But like, so, so it's it's not enough to be able to say like, oh, what do people use it for? But that, that is the, the thing I would promote people to use it for because it's the easiest replacement, right? You can try to do other stuff. Like if you're trying to make, um, so like, again, Bayesian modeling is not the best for, you know, doing predictive, predictive models. You know, you just use like, you know, cat boost or whatever. Um, but if you have a simple process, like you have a simple like relationship between two variables, like if you want to do causal inference, you want to figure out what is causing something and you have like three or four different factors that go into it, you can try to make a linear model out of it. And the benefit on versus doing simple linear regression is instead of getting p-values on the parameter estimates, you actually get a distribution of each of the, you know, each of the coefficients. And that can sort of tell you like, oh, you know, in what region of the data, which parameter is more likely to be dominant. Um, so it's, it's just like, it's just a better view into the, into the nature of the world. Okay. But still hypothesis testing, I think is a well, pretty common use case, right? Yeah, I would from say so. what I heard, and also I know in uh, advertisement in ad tech companies, um, it's more and more common to see Bayesian stuff. I'm not following exactly mm -hmm. this industry, but I used to work uh, there like I don't know four years ago. Right. And when I was working there, we primarily used uh, linear models, mm -hmm. but uh, then uh, I see a trend that more and more companies are talking about Bayesian stuff. I have no idea what exactly is happening there because, like, the moment I see the bias formula, my brain hurts. <laughs> uh, but yeah, <laughs> like it's yeah. very difficult to read papers for me uh, about Bayesian stuff. Yeah, no, for sure. And I, and I, uh, again, I think like, you know, I'm not uh, telling people to like, you know, let's replace all of their D tests with, you know, uh, Bayesian stuff tomorrow. But um, if you need more information into how things are happening and like a deeper view, um, it's perfectly easy to do. And like, it's very simple. Um, the problem is like, if you try to model a really, you know, a, there's a very nice um, course on sort of Bayesian statistics. It's called uh, uh, Statistical Rethinking. Um, it's on YouTube. It's 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 great. Um, but the professor in that course, you know, his research is Bayesian focused, and his models are like you know, ten thousand parameters, right? And the problem is ten thousand parameters. Like if you want to estimate that in a neural network, that's like you know, like this, uh, very easy. You can do it on your on your own laptop. But to do that for a you know Bayesian model, uh, you need I don't know, like a cluster. Um, so yeah. Um, I just recommend everybody to like a know about it and b I don't know this is just interesting you know you don't, you might not ever actually use it it's just interesting okay we have a question from Adonis so the question is assuming a data scientist does not have practical experience in Bayesian stats mm -hmm. what applications would you suggest them to try that will create the highest value um if you don't have any experience Step one is to read the book, uh, Bayesian Methods for Hackers. Again, I will link this in the in the whatever after show notes and stuff. Um, it's a hands-on method of actually how do you use Bayesian methods. It doesn't have very much theory, but you don't really need very much theory, as I hope I've shown in the talk today. Um, and the it has a bunch of like really nice examples of like what you can do with this, right? So it's it's like it's like you know once you know how to use a tool. Then when a new problem shows up, you can even at least think about using that tool. Sometimes a problem shows up and if you've never used a tool before, you don't even think about using that, right? So one way I would say, once you know this method, 
when new problems show up, you will think about using it. But if you just want to get started, just use t-tests. You know, I would recommend everybody who's doing a simple A-B test, you know, you know t-tests, test the assumption that the t statistic is, um, you know, close to normally distributed. When you actually test that out, I've often found it's like, you know, this weird flat or even a U-shaped distribution. It's very weird, right? And if that happens, your t-tests are basically providing you zero value, right? Just use a Bayesian um, sort of data generating process there um, to provide more value. And that's the first thing you can do. Okay. So Bayesian methods for hackers, right? That's yes. the book. Yes. Okay. So you will send me all the links and we will I will put them in the video description. Yeah. Probably, I don't know, we will need some time for that. So come back later, check mm -hmm. the descriptions and the links will be there. I guess that's all for today. Thanks a lot. Uh, that was a lot of uh, information, pretty packed. Uh, so no wonder you couldn't uh, <laughs> cover everything, but it was very interesting. So I will definitely go through this German tank problem notebook. Yeah. Yes, and, I, will, uh, I will link, uh, I will link. So the German tank problem thing, I just found it in a, in a, in a, in a blog today. And it's like, yeah, yeah, maybe I should put that in. So I'll just link that blog instead because it's just a, it's a really nice explanation. Mm -hmm. So yeah. But maybe the notebook too. I yes, like more. playing with code. Yeah, maybe yeah. more than just reading. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thanks a lot. That was fun. Thanks Thank for you. for cramming all that into from your two hours talk into one. That was very useful. And thanks everyone for joining us today for um, for asking questions from listening from watching. And uh, yeah, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Goodbye.